Welcome, friends, to the periodic table of history, where we study history in four dimensions. So we're going to go back in time to the time of Juba, an African king. That's during the time of Jesus. So we'll get a little bit better of a look and zoom up on our map just a little bit better. We're going to go back in time to Hannibal and then get ourselves caught up to the time of Juba too. We'll spend a little bit of our time talking about Herod and Jesus over here, and then we'll spend a lot of our time over here in Africa talking about Numidia. All right, that's a little bit better of a look. Now we're going to be talking about Numidia. And the setup for Numidia is going to happen by a man named Hannibal. And we've all heard about Hannibal, so let's get a little bit of background on him. He was considered one of the greatest military minds of all time. And what he is really known for is he took his troops up here through Spain, crossed the Alps, and then hit the Roman army from the back, did a crushing defeat. Hannibal was very good at doing tactical maneuvering with his army wherever he was located, finding the weaknesses of his enemies and using his own strengths and his enemies' weaknesses to gain the victory. He waged war during the Second Punic War, and that was from 218 BC to 201 BC. And you can see that if you are closer to Carthage, which is right across the way from Rome, how this would be a problem. You would be often looking at ships going back and forth across here off the coast of Italy and Sicily, and wondering whether they're friendlies or enemies. So that's something that Hannibal had to deal with all the time, and also Rome could flip this whole thing around and look at Carthage as an enemy while they watched all these ships go back and forth across the Mediterranean Sea. So these two points are the most strategic points on the Mediterranean as far as trade goes, because whoever owned this point could trade with the East and the West. Uh, also bypassed Egypt, you could cut out the middleman, um, etc. So this was definitely a place to be, but because everybody wanted to be there, location, location, location. Hannibal was defeated in 202 BC and Numidia was set up. Now, Pliny the Elder said that Numidia used to mean the word nomad and the word gradually morphed into the word Numidia. So now this kingdom of Numidia has to pay taxes to Rome, a thing that the Numidians don't like all that much, kind of like everybody. We have a few other characters that come on the scene then. Julius Caesar of Rome, Octavian of Rome, and Hyamsul of Carthage. This is a couple generations up from Juba II. And let's just look at our timeline just for a little bit. We'll zoom up here. Here's Hyamsul 288 BC to 60 BC. Yeah, we should also get Pompey on the scene as well. He's one of the major players in this conflict. Well, there's a rebellion in Africa, and that drove King Hyamsul from his throne. So what does he do? Well, they're paying taxes to Rome, so they call on Rome for help. Now Pompey, over here in Rome, was one of the triumvirate of Rome. And he came over to Carthage to help out and restore order, thus restoring the taxes that would go to Rome. Now Pompey ended up being victorious, which helped Hyamsul out. And Hyamsul also had a son, Juba, and Juba and Pompey became really good friends. They became allies. Now, Hyamsul died in 60 BC. Juba I went on to become the king, and the first thing he had to deal with was this land dispute. The noblemen of Numidia used Julius Caesar as their advocate against Juba I. So Juba I went to Rome, and was actually in the courtroom with Julius Caesar. Now during the trial, Julius Caesar grabbed Juba's beard and pulled his head downward in front of all the people in Rome, humiliating Juba. 
Juba was extremely wroth with this and vowed to be enemies of Caesar from that point on. Now, you didn't really want to go against Rome directly, but because of this triumvirate, it was possible to win favor with one general of Rome and lose favor with another. So Julius Caesar had just gone through his epic battles in Gaul and attacked all the way up into London in England. So he came back with spectacular victories and spectacular loot. So his popularity was very much on the up and up. So when Julius Caesar came back and started a fight with the Senate, Pompey decided to side with the Senate, and therefore Julius Caesar was Pompey's enemy. Well, this made Juba I automatically side with Pompey and the Senate against Julius Caesar. Now that happened in 49 BC. So in 48 BC, Juba II was born in Nigeria. At the same year, the Roman general Julius Caesar defeated Roman general Pompey. Okay, this leaves Juba I in a very bad situation because now he does not have the help of the Senate or of Rome itself. A large war ensued and Julius Caesar took his forces down here into Africa and Juba I had to face Julius Caesar. Now Juba I repelled one attack, but Julius Caesar's army was just too overwhelming for Juba I, so eventually Carthage was lost, and that meant Numidia, the kingdom, was back fully under the hands of Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar as the dictator. This is going into about 46 BC, and that's when uh, Rome annexes this whole area as not just a tributary, but a part of Rome. Now Juba I, with a crumbling army, died in 46 BC. But remember, now we still have Juba II, royalty. And Julius Caesar is right here on the land of Africa. So Caesar takes Juba II back to Rome, starts to raise him, but we know the story from Shakespeare. Julius Caesar gets assassinated in 44 BC. So now Juba II becomes the orphan of Octavian. Now, funny thing about this is Octavian is also trying to wield a great amount of power, and there are other characters on the world stage that also want to take power from him, and those are Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Mark Antony wills in his death Cleopatra should take all the empire of Rome. Octavian is actually pretty unhappy about this, and so there is a great war, and we've all heard about it. It's called the Battle of Actium. Now, this is during the time of Herod the Great, and that's why this coincides with history of the Bible. The Battle of Actium ensues. Mark Antony commits suicide. Cleopatra commits suicide by poison. Octavian is the victor. And lo and behold, Juba II is one of the people that fought alongside with Octavian. Remember, Juba II is his orphan, so he fights alongside Octavian. So Juba II is now on the winning side of the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. So Juba II was now set up as the client king of Numidia. Juba II wasn't necessarily a warfaring kind of a king. He was more of a scholar, so he wrote several books. One of them in 28 BC was Roman Archaeology. Now you've heard about Cleopatra as well, but there is also her daughter, because remember, the nobles just move these people around like chess pieces on, on their great schemes of world conquest. Cleopatra Selene II is awarded a bit of Mauritania. It's over here in the west of Africa. Now he marries Cleopatra Selene to Juba II, so now they have a royal wedding where it bonds together this northern part of Africa. So it's in 25 BC that this marriage ensues, and the expanded state of Numidia is now under Juba II and Cleopatra Selene II. Now from 30 BC to 25 BC, Juba II is quite busy. He writes Roman archaeology, uh, resemblances, 
another book, then on painting and theatrical history. When we get down to that same year of his marriage, 25 BC, he wrote The Wanderings of Hanno. And then somewhere, we don't know quite when, from 25 BC to 5 BC, he wrote On Libya and a pamphlet called Euphorbia. Euphorbia, this is a plant that had lots of medical uses. So Juba too was actually quite the scientist. Now, sadly, we don't have a lot of his writings left, but other people wrote about him because he was thought of as a amazing scholar. Juba II, king of Mauritania, after the defeat of his father at Thapsus, he was carried a prisoner to Rome, though quite a child, and compelled to grace the conqueror's triumph. Octavian, or Augustus Caesar, afterwards restored to him his kingdom and gave him in marriage Cleopatra, or Selene, the daughter of Antony and Cleopatra. To his literary pursuits, he is chiefly indebted for his reputation. His works are continually quoted by Pliny, who regards his authority with the utmost deference. Among his numerous works, he seems to have written a history of Africa, Syria, Arabia, and Rome, and also treaties on the stage, music, grammar, and painting. So yes, Juba II, quite a character. And remember, he was in the Battle of Actium. So now after the fact, that was 31 BC, now back here into 2 BC, into 2 AD, he takes a trip along the Mediterranean coast over here on the east side. It would have been probably pretty amazing to him to get into this area and think about being one of the big chess players on the board of the world and then looking at it in peacetime or at least calmer time than he was used to. But he went up along these coasts here 2 BC to 2 AD, and then he wrote those books on Arabia and on Assyria, somewhere around 2 AD to 5 AD. And at some point, Juba II took on a second wife. Her name was Glaphyria. And what's fun about this is if you remember, we can go to our timeline, and then the Herods enter, because remember this 2 BC to 2 AD time period is the same controversial time when we know about the Herods, Herod the Great, and the other ones, Archelaus, Philip, Antipas, and Salome I. So Herod the Great dies in 4 BC. So we think Jesus came on the scene maybe 6 BC. There's different arguments from about 7 BC to 2 BC. See then here in Matthew 2, 19 through 23, we have uh, details about Herod the Great and Archelaus and Joseph and Mary end up going back to Nazareth of Galilee. And when we look at our map here, we can see, yeah, uh, Archelaus is going to be governing this, this lower piece at this time. And so they go just out of reach over into to Galilee in the city of of Nazareth. And that's talked about in the Bible. What's fascinating to me about that in conjunction with the uh, King Juba II is Mary and Joseph could have been making this trip about the same time Juba II is traveling with ships along the coast here and then going into libraries finding out every detail he can about this area, about Arabia and Assyria. I find these type connections to be quite fascinating in the timeline. All right, so we heard about Juba II going over here in the east of the Mediterranean. He also took another trip over here to the west, to the Canary Islands, and he found these to be uninhabited. So a lot of his research that's found in Pliny the Elder were scientific phenomena. And one of the things he was curious about was purple dye. So he set up manufacturing operations here on the Canary Islands. Now that dye was done in the style of the Phoenicians, the ancient Phoenicians. So he set that industry up there. So the purple in the Roman Senate robes would have undergone this manufacturing process over here in the Canary Islands. Pretty fascinating. And that means that Juba II was quite the explorer too going all along this coast. He was a very curious kind of a person.
Now in 7 AD, the Gatulians decided to throw off the yoke of taxation from Numidia. And so there was a great revolt, and Juba too had to squelch that revolt. And you can see there's some pretty strategic areas in here where some groups could hide out against an empire. 7 AD, this is also the time of, a, of another interesting event when we come back over here in the east, and that has to do with Archelaus. We can go back over here to our timeline, and we have Archelaus, Herod Archelaus, from 4 BC to 6 AD. So remember, 7 AD is just right after this. Well, Rome is very unhappy with the governorship of Archelaus, so takes away his governorship and exiles him to Gaul. Now remember, on our, on our map, uh, Gaul is really an unfriendly place to Rome. So, so going there is like being banished to the utter end of the earth. And if you got killed there, Rome was actually uncaring. So Archelaus got banished, and he went over here to Numidia. And how we know this is that Juba's second wife, Glaphyria, divorces Juba too, and marries Herod Archelaus. Isn't that crazy? These are just some of the connections that I think are just incredibly awesome. So remember, Salome I died 10 AD. That would have been when Jesus was a little boy. Herod Archelaus being banished, then a little after that, marries another man's wife. And then we hear of other incestuous things going on with Herod Antipas and Herod Philip. And John the Baptist pointed this out, to which he lost his head over that. We know that story. So seeing these kind of connections is, is amazing. So this Glaphyria I, Juba II's wife, ends up marrying Archelaus, and they go off to, to this area of, of uh, Gaul. I don't know about you, but that always seems very amazing to me. And if you have some good insights, always feel free to comment in the comment section. That'll help everyone that's doing research in this area. So after the rebellion, and after all these books are published and distributed around this land, uh, the trade of fish, grapes, pearls, figs, grain, purple dye with Spain and Italy start uh, hitting their golden era. And I think it's amazing because this is the same time that Jesus is over here in the land of Israel as a boy growing up into a man. It is possible then that if some of these books were distributed from Juba II over here in Numidia, alongside Egypt and up into Judea, Jesus would have had the chance to have seen some of Juba II's actual books. The connections here are just fascinating. We don't know that that happened. It's just that it could have happened because this is the same time frame. So Juba II is named the scholarly king. So in AD 21, Juba II made his son Ptolemy joint ruler and Juba II died of natural causes in A.D. 23. This is going to be a little bit before John the Baptist loses his head and before the ministry of Jesus. So Juba II was buried in the royal mausoleum of Mauritania, and his son was Ptolemy of Mauritania. We can zoom out from the Middle East and the Herods and go back into Numidia. We can just see the timeline of Ptolemy here. So there's Juba II, 25 BC to 23 AD. And then we have Ptolemy, 23 AD to 40 AD. So he would have been king over in Africa the same time Jesus is being crucified. And we'll zoom out so we can get the big picture of that again. So again, this is Africa in the south. And then we have the northern hemisphere with Israel, right about right here on the grand scheme of things. And maybe you're here in India, maybe you are over here in Canada, and maybe you're over here in Scotland. But wherever you are, I just think this study of history is quite fascinating because we hear the Bible stories, 
but I think it's a lot more intuitive if we can connect them together with other histories. And we don't hear a lot about Northern African history. It's a, a shame that there's not a lot of writing in this area, and I'm sad about that. But getting my hands across, uh, Pliny the Elder references Juba. He calls him Juba, but it's actually Juba II. It's in Book 1. You see him again in Book 14 and Book 16 and in Book 37. And these books, they, they cover... Uh, geography, cosmology, and how they thought the, the world was. So there's other things in this book about fruit trees, about making of wine that Juba talks about, um, about gems. I can show you a couple of those. I just think they're pretty interesting. You know, they're just seeing different phenomena. The more they travel, the composite of knowledge is growing, and they're seeing a lot of exceptions, and then they're trying to explain those exceptions. And they're doing it very logically. I'm pretty fascinated with that when I look at these ancient texts and I realize how smart these people actually are. So you hear stuff on fruit-bearing trees, on the making of wine, about gems, where gems are located, different processes. They had thoughts on how the Egyptian pyramids were created. Uh, it's just really fascinating to read some of these texts. And when you realize that they're 2,000 years old, it makes it all that much better. And then when you read books in the Bible and realize that some books in the Bible are the same, 2,000 years old, like Acts or the Apostles, or you go back farther into the Prophets. So you can go back even farther to when Moses wrote down the Ten Commandments 3,400 years ago, and it gives me a great appreciation of the intelligence of people and how they've tried to overcome the situations that are put on them. So I hope you enjoyed that. This just gives you a glimpse into Africa with regard to the time frame of Jesus of Nazareth. We don't have a lot on when he was a boy, but we do have these other events that are going on around the world, which give us some insight into the world that Jesus grew up in, in his incarnate form on this world. Jesus would have been able to read about Juba II and Octavian Julius Caesar, just like we would be reading about World War II or the Gulf War. So maybe that gives us a little bit more perspective into this time and these places. Well, thanks a lot for listening thus far, and remember it's always free to subscribe. Have a great week, and I'll see you in the next video.